Cam and I are so pleased to have Podcorn sponsor today's episode of our True Crime Podcast. Explore sponsorship opportunities and start monetizing your podcast. Sign up today at podcorn.com slash podcasters. That's podcorn, P-O-D-C-O-R-N dot com slash podcasters. How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. We've got a fun little episode for you today. I am going to read a script that has been submitted by a listener. How exciting is that? Very. And I'm excited too. (laughs) I can tell. No, I By the sound of your voice. I am. No, today's script was written by Cynthia Raleigh. Yay, Cynthia. Right? Hey, and if anybody out there has, uh, you know, you're toying with the idea of maybe writing a script or starting your own podcast and you kind of want to just stick your toe in the water, feel free to send us the script and we will do it on our show. We will have a listener submitted script and we'll give you credit for it. And Cynthia said the reason why she sent it in, one, she wants to do like a little uh, book Mm -hmm. about this Mm -hmm. case. Because a lot of people haven't heard about it. So once we do this episode, I think she wants to try to release the, she called it a chat book. So, hey, we're more than happy. Yeah, I like that idea. So just send it in. And if you send it in, we'll send you a shirt. How does that sound? Just not any shirt. We will send you an Our True Crime Podcast shirt. How does that sound? Where's my shirt? You have some, don't you? I only have two t-shirts. Oh, well. I had to reorder some for me because my daughter takes it and my or my husband will take it and they like put bleach on it or food stains. So oh. I had to order me another one. Oh. Oh. Okay. Well, Good times. Let's hit it. I want to hear about this. I'm All right. You ready? This is all from Cynthia Raleigh and I'm going to try to read it exactly how she has it written. You ready? Yep. <laughs> It was just after 11 p.m. on December 2, 1954. A customer had just left, and 33-year-old Mary Holland was alone in the tiny Bell Mead liquor store she and her husband co-owned with her father. The usual steady stream of cars passing the store on the busy residential street had slowed down for the night. Only an occasional car or truck would pass by the store perched so close to the sidewalk. Her husband, Addison, better known around Evansville as Doc, would be arriving after finishing his shift at the Ellen Inn Railroad. Business had been good that day. People were stocking up for Christmas entertaining. Mary had been busy, and the cases of locally brewed sterling beer delivered that morning sat unopened. Some of the cases had Merry Christmas and scrolling letters printed on the side. Mary rolled up the sleeves of her blouse and switched off the electric space heater. It helped keep the poorly insulated frame building warm while she was serving customers, but she wouldn't need it moving boxes and shelving inventory. The carton sat just inside the exterior wooden paneled door, the one with white letters painted on the glass that read, If you're not 21, stay out! I've seen those signs. I have too, and I've seen them before I was 21. (laughs) The warning was repeated on the sign inside, We do not serve minors. Mary cut up in the top of the box and set to work. Doc Holland was a couple years older than Mary. He was 35. He had been working at the railroad for about 10 years and was now assistant yardmaster. Now, I had to look up what a yardmaster was because I wasn't really for sure. The yardmaster or the assistant yardmaster are the guys that take the trains apart oh. or get the trains from one track to the other. I so, did not know that. 
Yep, now you learned something today. I did. Making his way to the liquor store to help Mary close up for the night, he knew she'd been tired. The couple were expecting a child that summer. Mary had been on duty since 5 p.m., and he'd be glad for them to get home. They'd only live a couple blocks away from the store. It was about 11.15, 11.20 p.m. when Doc walked through the door of the liquor store. There were no customers inside, and he didn't see Mary. Uh-oh. He called her name as he slipped off his coat and tossed it over the stack of boxes. There was no response from Mary, and the store was silent. Doc made his way along the narrow aisle, and as he passed the counter, he saw an open bottle of Calvert's whiskey and the cash register drawer open, and it was empty. His fear grew when he saw Mary's purse dumped out on the floor, and her billfold was gone. He called out again, louder this time, but no answer. Doc hastened to the rear of the shop, to a small room served as a washroom. Maybe Mary was hiding or locked inside. The light was dim, and he could barely see Mary slumped on the floor in a partial kneeling position, her hands tied behind her back with twine and her head against the wall. She was tightly wedged between the toilet and the wall. She didn't respond to his voice or his touch. Rivulets of blood covered her face and the rest of her head. Concluding his wife had been beaten senseless in a robbery, Doc ran to the phone to call police. First on the scene were policewoman Nellie Williams and Sergeant Robert Gander, who were patrolling the neighborhood that night. Officer Gander tried to extricate Mary, but she was wedged tightly, and afraid of causing more harm, he waited until more officers arrived. Once Mary was freed from her position on the floor, it was clear that while she had been beaten, she also had a bullet wound in her right temple. The thirty-eight caliber bullet had passed through her skull and brain, exiting on the opposite side, and was now embedded in the wall. Mm. Mary Holland was transported to Baptist Hospital, where she was pronounced dead. The total amount stolen was estimated to be between $150 to $250. Now, in today's value... Today's inflation, it would be around $1,400 to $2,400. Yikes. That's a lot. Well, people need liquor to get through their family for Christmas, oh, right? That's true. Or get, that's true. Yeah. So let's go forward a few weeks, right? Okay. At 29 years old, Whitney Wesley Kerr was a veteran of both World War II and Korea. As a part of the 502nd Parachute Infantry, he served as a paratrooper in the Battle of the Bulge suffering severe frostbite to his feet and narrowly avoiding amputation. He married Peggy around 1949. Soon after, he re-enlisted, but before he was sent to the Pacific, he and his wife had welcomed two children, one Robert Wesley, or Robbie, and Debbie. After taking any odd job he could find upon moving to Evansville a couple of months before, Wesley was glad to have a stable job at the 24-hour full-service standard oil station at the intersection of Fairs Avenue and East Franklin, even if it was the late shift, especially since he and Peggy now had a three-month-old baby girl, Glenda Jeannie, and Christmas was almost here. The gas station was only about three-fourths of a mile from the Kerr home, and it was convenient for getting to and from work. And Cynthia has put that the block of homes are now gone and it's been replaced by industry. And the gas station has also been long gone and it's now a vacant lot. Wesley and Peggy spent a few minutes on the phone shortly before midnight on that December 22nd in 1954. They were planning to travel to Tennessee to celebrate Christmas Day with Wesley's family. Just after 1.30 a.m., now the wee hours of December 23rd, a car pulled into the lot. The driver exited the car, and he saw a man he assumed was an attendant come out from the building. The driver waved to the man and indicated that he was only stopping to buy a soda from the machine. The attendant returned the wave and stepped back inside, watching through the glass door. Soon the customer was again behind the wheel of his car and drove off the premises. The man inside hurriedly left the building, stuffing a wallet deep in his coat pocket. Now, police estimated that between 1.30 and 1.45 a.m., the station was robbed. A customer had seen Wesley alive at 1.30, but another customer entering the station about 1.45 found the place quiet. Like Mary Holland, Wesley was found at the station's bathroom in a kneeling position. His wrists were tied behind his back with twine. And although Wesley was also killed execution-style with a thirty-eight caliber weapon, 
He was shot in the back of the head rather than in the temple and left where he fell in the grubby bathroom. There was no sign of struggle, and he had not been beaten. The gunshot wound was the only wound. The customer who had seen the man he thought was an attendant couldn't describe him other than he had dark hair and he was wearing a coat. But based on other receipts at the scene, the robber netted about $68, which is only about $650 in today's money. Still a lot. Newspapers began describing the method of killing as either Chinese execution or Oriental style, which basically, probably not the best terms to use in today's world. Mm -hmm. But basically what that means in the People's Republic of China, when they execute someone, they still do it, but it was more prevalent back then, is when they, they just use one bullet and they shoot the prisoner either in the back of the head or in the neck. Ew. Why? That's a sure shot to kill him. I'm talking okay. that's how they execute prisoners. Nowadays, they do, I believe, do gas chamber, but I do believe a lot of places still do the gun to the back of the head. The two December murders created fear and a little panic in the city of Evansville. Gun sales increased, and locksmiths were busier than they'd been in a long time. School children were closely watched and warned of strangers. Teenagers weren't cruising the streets or hanging out in the evening. Most people didn't go outside after dark unless they had to. And another note from Cynthia. Her mother-in-law, Joan Board, 13 years old at the time, remembers the news reports and the articles. She recalls local men taking turns keeping an eye on their neighborhood, guns in hand. Ooh. Wow, can you imagine that? No. It was talked about at her high school and at home, and some kids were not allowed to walk to or from school by themselves. Adults discussed it at the grocery store, at hardware stores, beauty shops, and barber shops, and they were buzzing with theories and ever-growing stories. The December murders were labeled The Mystery of the Kneeling Corpses. That's Ooh. a great title of a novel, isn't it? It is. That's what Perfect she should name Perfect novel. Book. I know. Seriously, it's awesome. To the local residents, it was frightening not to know who it was, where he was, or if and when he'd kill again. The city of Evansville offered a $1,000 reward for any information leading to the murderer. But all went quiet. An uneasy Christmas came and went, and the city slipped into the new year without the killer striking again. People started relaxing. Mm -hmm. Maybe the gunman had to move on. Maybe he'd been arrested for a holdup or something and was now sitting in the slammer in another town. Nope. That must be it, right? Fast forward a few months. John W., 50 years old, and Wilhelmina Saylor, 47 years old, lived at a large farm they owned and operated in Posey County, Indiana, in the fat bottom land close to the banks of the Ohio River. It was very rural, but within a reasonable drive to the cities of Mount Vernon or Evansville. John W. worked the farm, and Wilhelmina took care of the house and their son. The sailors' first two children had died as infants, oh. and March 21st, 1955, spring was on its way, and there was a lot to do to get ready for planting. John W. came back to the house for his lunch, which Wilhelmina had already prepared for him. He finished by 1 p.m. and headed back out to work. Wilhelmina was washing the lunch dishes as he left. Their 11-year-old son, John R., or John Ray, rode the school bus and had a long ride from Mount Vernon. He reached the farmhouse around 4.15. Everything was normal outside, but once inside, all normality vanished. His mother was face down on the living room floor, her hands bound behind her back with her own apron strings. That's awful. Drawers were pulled out, shelves a mess, and newspapers littered the floor. And there was blood. Blood from a gunshot wound to the head. Mm. Only five minutes later at 4.20, John W., John Sr., pulled up to the drive and into the garage. As he exited the car, John Ray ran from the house, breathless and crying. Mommy's on the floor and won't get up. John W. entered the home and saw what his son had seen. He called the Mount Vernon police. Family was gathered together and given the news. As they comforted each other, they tried to make sense of it all. What could have happened and when? A family member who lived only a quarter of a mile up the same country road said that around 2 p.m., they saw a dark car pull into the driveway. A man got out, walked to the door, and knocked. That's all they could tell. 
They hadn't thought it unusual, and they hadn't stopped to watch. They could give no other description of the car or the man. The disarray of Wilhelmina's clothing led to the speculation the killer may have attempted to rape her. But an exam done by a physician showed she had not been raped. Panic returned. Mrs. Saylor's murder was too similar to Mary Holland and Wesley Kerr to be ignored. This time, the murderer had struck in the middle of the day. Stores again sold out of door locks. Businesses that employed door-to-door salesmen temporarily halted the practice when too many of their salesmen were met at the door by a woman pointing a shotgun in their face. Ooh, I don't blame them. Everyone was on edge. In addition to the murders, there had been a series of burglaries in the St. Joseph area just northwest of Evansville. No arrests had been made and there were no suspects. Frank McDonald Sr. was the current sheriff of Vanderburg County. He would later become a mayor of Evansville, wanted to get as many eyes as possible watching for anything out of the ordinary. So he put together a program called the Junior Sheriff Patrol. Young members were given patches and badges to wear, and they were instructed to stay alert and report anything suspicious in their neighborhoods to their parents or police. Which is kind of fun, right? I think, see something, say something, junior edition. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. Well, it's 1950s, too, because remember the... It's great. March 28, 1955, 20-year-old Raymond Duncan and his father, 51-year-old Goble Duncan, pulled into the driveway of their family farmhouse. The Duncan's 150-acre tobacco farm was in rural Henderson County, Kentucky. So now we're in Kentucky. We were in Evansville, Indiana. Hmm. We're in Kentucky now. He's moving on. Their son Raymond and his family lived in a house on the same property about a fourth mile from the main house. Raymond had taken the day off from his job. His wife, Mary Alice, had given birth to a son the night before, so he and his father, Goble, and his mother, Mamie, and sister-in-law, Mabel Elizabeth Duncan, and their two-year-old daughter, Shirley, were all going to go to the hospital to see the baby as soon as the ladies joined them. When Raymond and Goble entered the home, they walked into a burglary in progress. Uh oh. The intruder held them at gunpoint and took them away from the farmhouse. Mm. Later, two men were driving along the Trig Turner Road. The passenger, 17 year old Wallace Brown, gazed out the window at the frost nipped fields. As they passed a stand of trees, something caught his eye. He signaled to the driver to stop. Mm-mm. They got out, and there they found the bodies of Goble and Raymond Duncan Aww. lying on the swampy ground, hands tied behind their backs. The men raced to call the police. After an initial inspection of the bodies, a few officers made their way to the farmhouse to give the family the bad news. There was no answer at the door, but it was standing ajar, so the officers called out as he entered the home. Police found a similar scene at the house. Ugh. Elizabeth was found in the bedroom lying across the bed. She had had a gunshot wound to the back of the skull. Her slacks and underclothes were folded in a neat pile on the floor. Shirley, her two-year-old, sat beside her deceased mother. She was distressed and clinging to a stuffed rabbit. Mamie was discovered in an adjoining room, also with a head wound, but still alive. She was rushed to Henderson Hospital, where an armed guard was posted outside her room. She was gravely injured, but hopes were Mamie would survive so that she could give them information about the murderer. Mm -hmm. The impact of a triple murder was a heavy blow to the investigation. Terror had crept across the state line into Kentucky. Henderson County is directly across the Ohio River from Evansville, mere minutes away over the Twin Bridges. Police advised the public not to make unannounced visits to friends and family after dark. That's scary. The Henderson Gleaner, which I'm assuming is a newspaper, reported that a woman in a nearby town was home alone with her children when someone knocked on her door. She called out asking who it was, but got no answer. She blasted the door with a shotgun. Can you imagine? No. (laughs) Go her. Got to protect her and her kids any way possible. Heck yeah. Mamie Duncan was still fighting for her life while more than 1,500 people attended the funerals of her family. The horrible news traveled like lightning, but this time police were getting something to work with. And immediately, investigators canvassed all the residences in the area. John Ralph Gaines, a neighbor, reported seeing Raymond and Goble talking to one or two men in the front yard of the morning they were killed. Hmm. 
He hadn't paid particular attention because he didn't think it unusual and drove past. However, he had spotted a car parked a little way down the road from the Duncans. It was a sedan, dark in color, and he remembered that the left front side was damaged. Gaines said the car had an Indiana license plate, but he didn't take down the number. The next day, T. Walters from nearby Cordon, Kentucky, reported that he passed Raymond and Goebel in their car on Trigg Turner Road around 10 a.m. on the 28th. He said Raymond had recognized him and raised his hand in greeting. Now he realized it was an alert. The point where Mr. Walters had passed the Duncans was near the spot where the bodies were found just off the same road. The description of the car reported in the newspaper was meager, but it would bring the first solid lead for the investigation. Mrs. Dan Griffin of Sturgis, Kentucky, contacted police to say she'd been traveling to Evansville by way of Henderson County with her grandchildren, Thomas and Virginia, on the mornings of the killings. At 9.40 a.m., they'd been involved in a minor fender bender with a dark sedan. Mrs. Griffin said the damage was slight and the man didn't want to call the police, so she gave him $5 for repairs and continued on her way. Could you imagine $5 to repair your no. car? She remarked that she'd been a little unnerved when the driver turned his car around and followed them, but in less than two miles, he turned into the long driveway. It was in the Duncan's driveway, actually. In addition to the second description of a dark sedan with the left front damage, the police now had a solid description of the man driving it from someone who had spoken to him. The man was about six feet tall, stocky, dark brown hair combed straight back, and brown eyes. On March 30th, on the western ridge of Vanderburgh County, Gary Pierman, 19, a member of the Junior Sheriff's Patrol, his brothers and some of their buddies were hanging around the Pierman home when they decided to ride around in their friend Bill Williams' car. The 1940s Ford pulled out on Vienna Road and cruised along. On an unpaved road about 200 yards from Gary's house, the boys saw a dark car parked near some trees. They laughed and joked that it was probably the murderer. Yeah. Really? The man, yeah. The man appeared to have just come out of the woods and gotten back into the car, which slowly began to pull away. The boys turned on the road and rolled up alongside it. On a lark, one of the boys shouted to the driver, Hey, we're investigators! Sure. The car spun its tires and took off, but one of the boys managed to write down the license plate number. Indiana Plates EL351. Gary Pierman noticed the damage on the front left fender. Two days later, April 1st, Gary's brother, Alan Pierman, was visiting a friend when they read about a car very much like the one he and his brothers and friends had seen. Alan took the article to his mother and told her about it. Mrs. Pierman immediately called the sheriff and reported the information. The plate number was checked. The black 1947 Chevrolet belonged to Leslie Irvin, a convicted criminal who was out on parole from the Indiana State Prison in Michigan City, Indiana, after serving nine years for first-degree burglary committed in Indianapolis. So let's talk about the murderer. Let's. Jerk. Leslie Irvin was born April 2, 1924, in Evansville, Indiana, the sixth of eight children of Edward and Alice Irvin. Not much detail is available on his early life other than he incurred multiple offenses for theft and various misdemeanors. Later, some Evansville police officers who had known Irvin since childhood remembered him setting fire to the Benjamin Bosset High School at 15, more than once just for fun. Um, you got you definitely got issues there, buddy. Uh-huh. Irvin only attended the high school for one year before he was sent away for his transgressions. In the 1940 census, he's documented as an inmate at White's Indiana Manual Labor Institute, south of Wabash, Indiana. White's Institute began in 1852 as a school for, quote, poor children, white colored Indian, such as have not the means to procure food, board, clothing, end quote. Josiah White, he lived from 1781 to 1850, had designated $40,000 for the school, which was a huge sum of money then. In 1882, Whites included an, quote, Indian training school, where the children of Native Americans from west of the Mississippi River were taken from their parents 
by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and placed at White's to, quote, advance their civilization. Oh, my. Ugh. The Indian school closed in 1895, and after 1896, White's focused on children of the courts, ultimately becoming an institution for juvenile delinquents, one of whom would be Leslie Irvin. What a horrible time in history. Right? And I could say that about almost any time in history. It's just unreal how awful people can be about other people's ancestry. Just all of it. Or heritage. How they they treated people. How we still treat people Mm -hmm. of color. It's Mm -hmm. ridiculous. All right. Off my soapbox. In 1943, Irvin enlisted in the military, probably as a way to avoid jail. He and Trouble weren't separated for long, and Leslie spent an impressive amount of time in military lockups. Leslie never moved out of his parents' house on John Street. The block where Irvin home is located is now gone, and it was demolished for Highway 41 expansions. But the house would have been about 10 to 12 blocks northwest of the Bellmead Liquor Store, where he killed Mary Holland, and four to five blocks east of the filling station where he killed Wesley Kerr. The arrest came on April 8, 1955, while Irvin was at work. He was employed as a steam pipe insulator at the Southern Indiana Gas and Electric Plant on the Ohio River at Yankeetown, Warwick County, Indiana, what is now the F.B. Cully Power Generating Station. Two Evansville police officers and Indiana State Police Officer William Cornett arrived and forced Leslie to the ground, pinning him there. It was later reported that the Southern Indiana Gas and Electric Company had revealed that Irwin had not shown up for work seven Mondays in the row, including that of March 21st when Wilhelmina Saylor was killed and March 28th when the Duncan family was killed. I wonder if anybody that he worked with put that together. Like, that's, Mm -hmm. you know, one time it's a coincidence, but I mean... Seven Mondays in a row? Yeah, that's a little, you know, I don't know. Both Indiana and Kentucky wanted Leslie Irvin. Sheriff Lee Williams wanted Irvin extradited to Kentucky for the Duncan murders, but Indiana declined. Since the killer was arrested in Indiana and the first three murders were committed in that state, Indiana would be the first to have a go at Leslie Irvin. Irwin was indicted in Vanderburg County for the murder of Wesley Kerr, and the murder charges were filed April 14th. The Kerr murder was chosen to go to trial since police had the most tangible evidence related to this case. When arrested, Irvin had Wesley Kerr's wallet with him, but this was later disputed. Many people thought it wasn't Wesley's wallet. But at the trial, at least two people, including Kerr's mother-in-law and the arresting officer, identified the wallet as being Wesley's. Mm -hmm. According to the newspaper report on the same day, Evansville Police Chief Kirby Stevens announced that Irvin had admitted all six killings. This was corroborated by Evansville Chief of Detectives Dan Hudson, who stated Irvin had confessed to him on the evening of Wednesday, April 13th, after five consecutive days of intense questioning. Hudson further explained that Irvin's confession consisted of scattered oral statements that were taped rather than written, but they, quote, added up to substantially detailed description of how the six murders were committed. Hmm. During the trial, many objections were made by the defense over the recording and the lack of written signed confession. The recording was deemed inadmissible for two main reasons. It contained discussion about all the murders, and specific information couldn't be isolated well enough from the reel-to-reel tape, and the tape was unclear and muffled even when listened to in a quiet room. The judge felt trying to listen to it in the courtroom with 200 spectators would prove inaudible. He stated, quote, if the jury can't clearly hear it at all, they'll hear none of it. This led to more objections since the summarized transcript of the interviews Detective Hudson brought to the trial was signed only by himself and another officer. When asked why Hudson didn't have Leslie Irvin sign the transcript, he said he hadn't asked because Irvin, quote, told me days before he wouldn't sign anything. A witness to the confessions, State Police Detective Charles Young, said Irvin showed very little emotion as he related on how he committed the crimes. Because he's a psychopath. Mm -hmm. Irvin was driven to Indianapolis for polygraph three days after his arrest. 
The 90-minute test results were not made public, only that it was inconclusive. The Ooh. test was not admissible, but during the trial, Hudson indicated Irvin had lied. Wendelin Opal, an Indiana State Police officer, drove Irvin to Indy along with some Kentucky State Police officers and inexplicably John Saylor, the husband of murdered Wilhelmina Saylor. The report doesn't say if they rode together, but it seems likely it was an awkward trip. No doubt. Can you imagine? I'm surprised they didn't beat the shit out of him. Right. Maybe. I would have. They might have. Despite Irvin using his suit coat to cover his head during transit to and from Indy, plenty of photos of him appeared in the newspapers. Detectives reported he was, quote, boiling mad and said he'd break cameras if he got the chance. Sounds like a young Sean Penn to me. Mm. (laughs) Or Alec Baldwin today. Yep, exactly. On April 14th, details of the oral confession were released and published in all area newspapers. Everything about Irvin was as widely publicized as the reporting of the murders. Newspapers all over the country carried the murder story, but locally, every crumb of information that could be scrounged up was printed, including information about his convictions for arson 15 years previously, for burglary, and a court-martial on AWOL charges during World War II. Irvin had accomplished nine separate escapes from confinement in different military installments in his time of the service. Eventually, the Army tired of dealing with him and turned him over to civilian authorities for crimes committed while enlisted. Wow, that probably takes a lot to do. Mm. On April 21st, a Vanderburg County grand jury indicted Irvin on two counts of first-degree murder for Mary Holland and Wesley Kerr. Prosecutor Paul Weber indicated Vanderburg County would try Irvin for both murders and ask for the death penalty. Irvin was examined by two doctors on May 9th and deemed sane and fit for trial. Because of the coverage, public defender Robert Hayes requested a change of venues, quote, on account of local prejudice. I think he'd probably be right about that. This was granted by Vanderburg Circuit Court Judge Ollie Reeves. I love these old names. I I really do. The trial was moved to neighboring Gibson County. Immediately dissatisfied with this location, Hayes objected on the grounds that saturation reporting also occurred in Gibson County and requested the venue move back to Vanderburg. What? Where they felt the larger population gave them a better chance of seating an unbiased jury. Mm -hmm. On May 11, 1955, Gibson Circuit Court Judge A. Dale Eby denied that request, citing an Indiana law which allowed one change of venue, which he stated had already been granted. An appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was denied because Irvin's attorneys, quote, had not exhausted state court remedies. On May 12th, Irvin was arraigned in Gilbert County, where he entered a plea of not guilty and was taken to the county jail. Judge Eby set a trial date of November 14th and appointed attorneys Ted Lockyer and James Lopp to represent Irvin. They both were from Evansville, Indiana. In a foreshadowing of what was to come, Before the jury was even seated, defense attorneys filed a petition citing an error in the return of the murder indictment up by the grand jury. The petition charged that the jury foreman should have written the phrase, quote, a true bill on the indictment in longhand, but it had been printed. Got it? Mm -hmm. The defense maintained the grand jury indictment may have been an illegitimate one substituted for the real one. That's kind of picking. That's being pretty damn. They're doing everything they can. Mm -hmm. The judge denied the plea. On November 1st, calls for jury duty went out and jury selection began November 14th. Irvin attended, as did his mother, who sat beside him. This process would stretch into a miserable fourth week. An estimated 550 potential jurors were interviewed, most all of them rejected by the defense team. Some disqualified themselves with remarks such as this response from Ben Grise, quote, they ought to take him out and do to him what he did to those other people. Or this one from Ruth Bass, who was temporarily chosen as a juror until she said, quote, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. This started a tip for tap between the defense and the prosecution with attorney Lopp quoting Bible scriptures in his argument. Church and state people, separation. Mm-mm. Prosecutor Weber requested that the interviewees be excused for the day if Lapp was going to preach the Bible lesson. 
The list of objections by the defense throughout jury selection was so repetitive that it's not going to be, we're not going to go into it. Mm -hmm. Finally, on December 7th, a jury of 12 men were seated. Get it? 12 men. A jury of 12 men. No women. Mm -hmm. Men. Mm -hmm. Unlike today, the names, occupations, and townships of residents for jurors were in the paper. Some admitted to having an opinion of Irvin's guilt, but they felt they could arrive at an unbiased decision based on the evidence. This was the best the court could do to fill the seats and would be a major factor in a later appeal. The trial began when Deputy Prosecutor Howard Sandusky making an opening statement that declared they would prove Irwin committed first-degree murder during a robbery. The defense waived the right to make an opening statement. The first group of witnesses were called Saturday morning, December 10th. With each new witness taking the stand, the story of what happened to Wesley Kerr would unfold. William Cooper was the first witness called. He had been walking home after his late shift at the Chrysler plant, which ended at 1.30 a.m. Since he knew Wesley, he stopped in the station to say hello. Seeing no one, Cooper looked around. He saw a light coming from the area of the restroom and went to take a look. As soon as he saw Wesley's leg sticking out of the doorway and a large puddle of blood, he took off to a shell station at 41 in Virginia Street, a block away. He asked the attendant there to call the police and then returned to the standard station to wait for them. Cooper gave testimony about the placement of the body and the interior of the station when he arrived. He saw no bullets or shell casings, but he did see three dimes on the floor. He recalled the cash register was closed. He knew that the cash register was the type that needed a key to open, but he had not seen a key to the register. Burke Harl Captain of the Evansville Police Bureau of Investigation was called next and asked about nine photos of the body, station, cash register, and a bullet on the floor near the safe. Attorney Lopp promptly ejected to each one, requesting all be thrown out, and said the photo taken after the body was removed was not a true representation. What? What? I don't get it. I don't... Why? I mm, Anything. I guess. Oh, they're just, yeah, picking up. They're just saying anything. A 21-year-old Evansville College junior, Bailey Kennard, was called to the stand and testified that he also worked at the Chrysler plant. He worked until 1.30 a.m. and driven to the Shell station where Cooper had fled to call the police. He witnessed a man he identified as Cooper run into the station, talk to the attendant, and then leave. The attendant told Kennard that Cooper said the attendant at the Standard Station had been beaten. Kennard then drove to the Standard Station and asked Cooper what happened. Cooper said his friend was in the restroom and that he thought he was dead. Kennard also saw three dimes on the floor, but no bullets or casings. When cross-examined, he stated he didn't know Cooper before that night, but he had seen him at times at Chrysler since they both worked there. Asked if he'd seen Cooper at work that night, he said no. Kennard denied seeing any car parked nearby, but he said he did see police officers questioning, quote, a colored man. Mm. The defense tried to undermine the state's timeline by claiming Cooper couldn't have walked the distance to the plant to the station in the time he said. An Indiana State Police Sergeant Cornett had previously accompanied Cooper on a walk of the route he had taken that night and deemed the times given by Cooper checked out. Rudel Clark, an Evansville police officer, was next. He was in the squad car when he received a radio call at 1.46 a.m., quote, something being wrong with the attendant at the standard station. He and his partner, Officer Lester Brown, were the first to arrive. He felt the victim's wrist for a pulse, but he was dead. Officer Brown radioed for other officials and senior staff to attend the crime scene. Clark said about 30 minutes after arriving, he questioned, quote, a colored man, who told him he saw Kerf an hour before he'd stopped to thank him for towing a car a couple nights ago. Cross-examination focused on a perceived failure to obtain the man's name, but the officer stated he did have the man's name and could contact him. The last witness of the day was Dr. Francis Caro, the pathologist who performed the autopsy. Cause of death was a bullet traveling from the lower back of the head, just left of center, through the brain, and exiting just above the right eye. He identified photos of the victim and the fatal wound. The defense objected to the photos, but was overruled. The defense objects to everything. Yes, they do. They're just wussies. 
Throughout the testimony, Irvin sat relaxed in a swivel chair with an unmoving expression, sometimes chewing gum or speaking with his attorneys. He glanced at autopsy photos with no visible change in expression. His mother again was seated next to him. Among the spectators of December 12th were members of the Duncan family from Kentucky. Mamie, who was permanently blinded from the attack, was let in and sat by Veta Phelps, her daughter. Veta held Shirley Fay, who had been found seated in the bed next to her murdered mother. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed Shirley was described as wearing a cowgirl skirt and boots. She would soon turn three. First witness was Kenneth King, deputy coroner who verified he was called to the scene in the wee hours of December 23rd. He examined the body in situ, which means where in the original place where he laid in the grubby bathroom floor. He said the bullet was still protruding two-thirds of the way from the victim's skull, so he had removed it and handed it to Captain Harl. Nobody would do that today. Mm-mm. Nobody. He verified the body position and wounds as pictured. When asked to ID a bullet given as evidence, he testified it looked like the same bullet because it had a flattened area on one end that he remembered. King stated he'd noticed the cash register was empty on that night, on the night he attended, and that he also seen another bullet on the floor in front of the safe and three dimes on the office floor. Captain Harrell was called to ID the bullet as the one he had seen Dr. King removed. He stated he knew it because at the time he scratched his initial H into the end cap and placed it in a container that he kept in the cabinet in his office. He took evidence and scratched in an H for Harl. <laughs> what? I, know, I get it's 1950s, but really? Cam and I, we both love having an independent podcast. What we don't love is getting overlooked for sponsorships because our podcast isn't quite a household name. At least not yet. But that's all about to change thanks to Podcorn. Podcorn is like a dating site for podcasters and sponsors. Big or small, Podcorn brings together sponsors and podcasters on an easy-to-use platform. You will work directly with sponsors you choose while picking the type of ad you want to do and you even get to set your own rates. You will never give up the rights to your podcast, and Podcorn will help you all the way, including making sure you are compensated for the work you do for the brands. We've just started using Podcorn, and I really can't believe how simple the whole process is. I mean, we booked three ads our first try. So just don't sit around waiting for sponsorship opportunities to come to you. Make your sponsorship opportunities happen now. Go to our show notes. Click on Podcorn's link and start browsing sponsorship opportunities today. He revealed that the bullet had been removed from his office while he was out of town and sent to the state police headquarters for testing. He had not been in position of the bullet for six months. Attorney Lapp attempted to discredit this as the same bullet, saying, quote, Anyone could have put it there. The judge overruled and the bullet was given to the jury as evidence. Harl stated that he had dusted the register, the pop bottles, matchbooks, sides of the safe, and register, but found no legible latent prints. Kerr's cap found on the floor was produced bearing an ID tag as Exhibit 14. As it was being given to the jury for examination, Lop ejected, stating the tag was not part of the evidence and would serve to influence the jury. Judge Eby reminded Attorney Lop that Lop himself had examined the exhibits pre-child, and the tag was on the cap then, and he had not objected to it, so overruled. Three dimes found on the floor in the station were then presented. Lop objected to the exhibit of the dimes, not because of the coins themselves, but the envelopes they were in. No reason given but the dimes were removed and taped to cardboard, which seemed to mollify the lawyer. William Bradley was next on the stand. Bradley was identified as, quote, 26 Negro employee of the Rexall Supply Company. He was the man speaking with police the night of the murder who stated he'd talked with Wesley between 1 and 1.30 to thank him for his help. Bradley said he and his girlfriend had been driving around when he drove to the station. 
Wesley was outside, so he stopped and talked to him for a while, then left. About an hour later, Bradley was stopped by an officer who knew him and knew he was acquainted with Wesley Kerr. He told him Wesley had been murdered. Bradley told the officer he had just seen Wesley and returned to the gas station to report it to the police there. Attorney Lapp conducted that it was described as, quote, severe questioning of Bradley's actions that night. By far the star witness of the afternoon was William Maxey, a truck driver from Louisville. He ID'd Irvin by pointing to him at the courtroom as the man he saw in the filling station talking with Wesley Kerr the night of the murder. He drove to Evansville from Louisville and saw a clock which read 1.35 a.m. as he did so. Kerr was sweeping rocks off the pavement by the street as Maxey approached, so he stopped and rolled down the window to chat for a minute. As he talked with Kerr, he saw another man exit the station and walk directly towards him. He said he paid particular attention to the man because, quote, I was afraid the guy was going to ask me for a ride. Haven't we all had those fears? <laughs> End of quote. Sorry, don't mean to laugh. He described Irwin as having, quote, funny looking eyes, and he didn't think he'd ever forget them. Lop questioned Maxie about William Cooper, the man who discovered the body, implying that it was Cooper with Kerr at the time. Maxie said prosecutors took him to Cooper's house to see if he was the man he'd seen with Kerr. He'd firmly stated he immediately knew he'd never seen Cooper before. In response to being asked if he'd seen Irvin since the night of the murder, Maxie said he had picked Irvin from a lineup in April, and he had no doubts about his identification. Station owner Thurman Barnett testified that examination of the register tape showed $68.11 was taken from the register. He affirmed that the key was still missing. Mrs. Glenn Arnold, Wesley's mother-in-law, identified the wallet found on Irvin during the arrest on April 8th as being her son-in-law's. From the moment it began, the trial was a never-ending litany of objections, to the point where Judge Eby became irritated and ordered a night court session to try to make some progress. The defense continued to object on, quote, invalid arrest grounds and countless others. The jury was frequently asked to leave the courtroom once for two full days because the defense objected to the jury even hearing their objections. Can you believe that? No. This different time, I guess. The defense listed various reasons for the claim of false arrest, but they were complicated or contrived and all were overruled. Despite this outcome, some very tense moments for the prosecution arose over this issue. The objection that the arrest was made by a Vanderburg County officer in Warrant County, where he had no jurisdiction, was settled by the fact that the one arresting officer, Sergeant Cornett, was a member of the Indiana State Police and had jurisdiction anywhere in the state of Indiana. Dan Hudson, chief of detectives in Evansville, was called for his much-awaited testimony concerning the confession of Leslie Irvin. Hudson talked with Irvin about Wesley Kerr on April 8th, the day of his arrest. When Hudson was asked what Irvin had said, Lopp objected and requested the jury be removed from the room. His objection was lengthy, and 25 minutes were spent recording the allegations of maltreatment of Irvin. Dubious interrogation techniques, method of arrest, unlawful custody, and violating the Bill of Rights and the Indiana Constitution. The jury could not hear Hudson's testimony until the judge ruled on the objections. That afternoon, Doris Jones, the girlfriend of William Bradley, testified. Her account tallied with those of Bradley. William Whitaker, an Evansville police officer, who was also called to the scene, testified he was the officer who notified Bradley of Kerr's death. The defense harshly questioned Whitaker about Bradley's character, and the officer replied while well, he'd known Mr. Bradley for quite some time and considered his character to be good and that he was honest. At that point, the jury had to be sent to an hotel early since the judge needed time to rule on the objections before the trial can continue. Morning of December 15th, still minus the jury, Detective Hudson was questioned about his interviews with Irvin, his methods, length of interviews, and documents related to the interrogation. Hudson stated he brought, quote, all the records he can find, which were a few notes from his own interview of April 9th. The infamous confession that was given April 13th, during which notes were not taken since it was recorded, Lop called for a typewritten copy 
of the recording to be presented as evidence. Lop is doing what he's supposed to do, but damn, he's frustrating. (laughs) The defense team acted upon their belief Irvin had been interrogated day and night for long periods of time and that his confession was coerced. They asked questions regarding mistreatment in jail and whether he was permitted to have reading material, cigars, visitors, phone calls, were there any rats or roaches in the jail? What food was he served? What? Irvin had been provided with all of these, including steak and fried chicken when he wanted them, being allowed visitors outside of regular visiting hours, and Hudson had personally visited Irvin's parents' home to deliver messages from their son. He got treated a lot better than most people today. Totally. Like, and I mean not just why? prisoners. I'm talking most people. But why do you think that is? I don't know. He said Irvin hadn't wanted to tell his parents about his situation and would feel better if Hudson would do it, which he had. Others were interviewed about the same points, all agreeing with Hudson. However, Lop continued to hammer witnesses with questions about interrogation times and jail conditions. The jury was still barred from the courtroom during this testimony. Hudson stated that the evening of April 13th, Irvin had confessed to the murders to him. He said the killer had refused when asked to sign a confession. Hudson later testified he didn't ask Irvin that evening to sign a confession. In response to being asked why, he said that Irvin had told him several days before that he wouldn't sign anything, so Hudson didn't bother to ask. On the 16th of December, Irvin was brought to the court not only handcuffed, but chained to Sheriff Holland, prompting the nickname Mad Dog Irvin. Two days had been consumed without the jury's presence by the defense objections of conditions and a coerced confession. Judge Eby overruled and determined the jury would hear testimony of the confession. In irritation, the judge committed that jail was not a hotel and no more would be said about this. The jury was ordered back to the courtroom. Dan Hudson stated that at one point, Irvin said he wanted to plead guilty. Prosecutor Weber told Irvin that they'd need some evidence, and Irvin asked, quote, What do you want? Weber told him he wanted the gun he used to kill Wesley Kerr. Irvin agreed to take detectives where he had disposed of the gun. He directed officers to the edge of the Stockwell Woods, which is now Wesselman Park, and said he'd thrown the gun into a stream about four feet deep, four feet wide. It's possible the stream may have been the remains of the Wabash Erie Canal, which is located at the point, and it fits the description. That's per Cynthia. Hmm. After searching in the cold water, the police were unable to find the gun, but few officers returned later with Marvin Karsh, a city street superintendent, who brought along a pitchfork and found the thirty-eight revolver submerged in the water. Oh, he does. Yeah. Yeah. Hudson said it was at this time he took the gun and scratched his initials into it, but that he'd never shown the gun to Irvin for him to identify. Why are people scratching initials into evidence? I'm at a loss for words. Do they want it back? Are they tagged? Is this like graffiti tag? It's mine? I guess. How, How bizarre. Just thank God things have changed. When the Colt revolver was shown to Irvin... He asked if this was the gun found where he said to look. Being told that it was, he replied, quote, Then I guess that's the gun, isn't it? Oh, God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, that showed him. Evidence that might have been vitally important to the prosecution was the coat Wesley Kerr had been wearing when he was shot. Irvin had stated that the gun went off while he was restraining Kerr's arms, and he knew it made a hole in the coat. Henderson, Kentucky Sheriff Lee Williams also verified that he heard Irvin talk about this during his interview. When Detective Hudson asked where the coat was, he replied he didn't know and said police had searched for it, but, quote, never turned it up. Hmm. The afternoon heard multiple witnesses verify previous statements when an argument broke out between defense attorney Lockyer and prosecutor Sandusky. It was discovered that Lockyer was using a transcript of a recording which had been disallowed as evidence for the prosecution based on the defense's own objections, yet he was using it to cross-examine witnesses in Irvin's defense. 
Judge Eby ordered Lockyer to relinquish the transcripts to the prosecutor, who had not been allowed to see it. The judge then ruled that no lawyer would be allowed to question a witness using the transcript or any other written material that was not admitted. This is like a circus. This really trial is. seriously is a circus. How much money Unbelievable. I was wasted? I, you know, I don't know. It's unreal. During her December 18th testimony, Evelyn Perkins, the married girlfriend of, quote, Mad Dog, revealed Irvin had written her asking her to purchase hacksaws, quote, the best kind you can get, and bring them to him in jail. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. The defense pounced on this and requested the jury be removed again, stating they wanted to prove the letter was illegally obtained from Mrs. Perkins by the prosecution. But the witness piped up to say no one had obtained anything because she had burned the letter the same day and told Officer Cornette about the letter's contents. The defense then objected to her testimony because without the letter, her statement was hearsay. Overruled, and the jury was returned. Hmm. Indiana State Police Sergeant Edward Replogle from Indianapolis was grilled by the defense regarding the ballistic testing. Lapp argued he was not qualified to test the gun and his testimony should be dismissed. Replogel replied that he had a degree from Indiana University Medical School, Purdue University, Harvard Medical School, and had been with the state police lab for 10 years. Overruled, Replogel testified that the bullet retrieved from Kerr and the bullet's test fired could definitely have been made from the same firearm. Both were 38 caliber had six lands and grooves, and a left-hand twist. He said the only type of gun marked in this matter is a thirty eight caliber Colt revolver, unless it was a gun of foreign make. Saturday court heard testimony from a laundry list of witnesses, much of them covering the same ground. Harold Shoemaker, a bartender who worked at the downtown Evansville restaurant, the steamboat, positively ID'd his stolen gun and produced a permit with his name and serial number that matched the Colt revolver. Well, now he's lucky because he's got Detective Hurl's name etched into it, so now he'll really know that it's his gun. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Maybe they lost stuff in evidence back then. So Maybe. They just, you know, they just I want, wrote their name on it. I just it. want this back. Yep. After the few last witnesses, prosecution witness testimony ended. The prosecution made their final arguments and rested their case. The defense asked for a short recess to confer with their client. After 45 minutes, they filed a motion to give preemptory instructions to the jury that the defendant was not guilty. And preemptory means that if the jury agrees to the facts and evidence stated by one party, they should find in favor of that party. So overruled and defense told to proceed. Attorney Lopp announced that, quote, the defense refuses to proceed further in the matter of reasons of previous objections to the seating of the jury and also other motions previously filed for continuance to change of venue. Lopp then requested all of his previous motions be renewed. Now, at this point, the judge should have just thrown the attorney out of the fucking courtroom. <laughs> Seriously, or taken the cult revolver that Harl wrote his name on and just shot him dead. I'm serious. He's <laughs> this is ridiculous. Judge Eby overruled all of that and calmly stated that since the defense declined to call any witnesses or make their arguments, the court had apparently heard all of the evidence there was. So, quote, bang, bang, we're done with this portion of the trial. The jury was sent to the hotel to wait final instructions and closing statements. On December 20th, final statements were made and the case went to the jury. Mrs. Irvin thanked the jury for their consideration. And then, because his behavior isn't bizarre enough already, Attorney Lott proclaimed to the courtroom that Leslie Irvin's current position was comparable to Jesus's position. He said, quote, that's right. One little man hollered, crucify him, and he was crucified. <laughs> I, I must have missed that story. Yeah, uh, same. I Unreal. And to the jury directly, he said, quote, You are here today because of one little piece of paper. 
and one little piece of paper caused the crucifixion of Jesus. Mm. That is why it's no problem in Evansville for a real killer to get away, end quote. They huh. weren't in Evansville, and Mad Dog is a Jesus, obviously. Lop continued his rants, quoting Bible verses until Sandusky was goaded into responding. Lop became quite angry and accused Prosecutor Sandusky of setting himself up as Pontius Pilate, then turned to the jury and said, quote, that makes you the angry mob. I'm just thinking there's no way that this would fly in today's courtroom. Oh, it, no, okay. I he would know the, the Bible verses and all that. I mean, well, any of this wouldn't. Hopefully. God, I hope not. After scurrying out of the courtroom, the jury took barely more than 90 minutes of deliberation to return a verdict of guilty in the slaying of Wesley Kerr and recommended the death penalty. The defense requested a poll of individual jurors, which was granted. Each juror was interviewed separately to ensure that the verdict was their true decision. It was. On January 9, 1956, Leslie Irvin was formally sentenced to death by electric chair. Scheduled for execution before sunrise on June 12, 1956. He was to be held in Gibson County Jail until January 23, 1956, when he'd be transferred to the Indiana State Penitentiary, where his execution would take place. Meanwhile, his attorneys filed more appeals. Hmm, of course they did. Duh. After the trial, reporters asked Sheriff Holland if he was going to arrange for a night turnkey, or a guard, in the jail since the current county budget didn't allow for one. His reply, quote, no, that's not necessary. The sheriff would come to deeply regret this remark. So, yes, it's not over yet. Mm -mm. Never is, Jen, never is. It never is. Around 7 a.m. on January 18th, Ruby Drew, I like that name, Ruby Ooh. Drew. Ruby Drew, that's a cute name. Daytime turnkey, which is a guard, arrived at the jail for work. He first went to the basement to check the furnace and noticed the basement dart in the alley was ajar. He looked around and saw nothing, so he closed it. Drew proceeded to the cells and found Irvin gone. Since the cell he shared with 57-year-old Loris Bryant, charged with a triple murder, was a double cell connected by a walkway, including a shower, Drew hastily made sure Irvin was indeed gone. Bryant said he was asleep and knew nothing. Drew sounded the alarm. Irvin probably found much satisfaction in this escape since he previously declared that no jail could hold him, and this particular jail touted itself as escape-proof. Mm -hmm. Now, here's my problem. He had already asked his girlfriend to buy the best hacksaws that mm -hmm. she could get, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it kind of shocks me that they didn't... They didn't see it coming? You'd think, yeah. The sheriff and his family lived in private quarters upstairs at the jail, but were completely unaware of the breakout. Drew stated as he walked toward the cell area, he heard Mrs. Holland unlocking the all-steel door on the opposite end of the corridor. She testified the keys were still in the drawer that morning, where they were always kept. The last time Irvin had been checked on was by the same turnkey, Ruby Drew. He said everything was normal when he checked the prisoner the night before. Sheriff Holland commented, quote, We're sure of one thing, and that is Irvin had helped to get out of jail. It's practically impossible for Irvin Hiff to have done it himself. There's almost as much reporting on the escape and manhunt as the trial, so only highlights will be mentioned. Irvin had to pass through four locked steel doors and the wooden paneled door he'd left open as he disappeared into the snowy night, taking his blue suit and gray top coat with him. Purcell had insisted that opening his own cell door would have been impossible without, quote, someone standing there helping him. He had said that even at his own weight of 195 pounds, that he had to use both hands to lift the steel plate on the outside of the cell door to access the keyhole. Irvin, quote, couldn't have reached it with only one hand, even if he had keys. Now, how Irvin managed his escape wouldn't be known until later, but on that cold January day, what was known was that the convicted murderer had an estimated 10-hour head start. An alert was put out for Irvin. 5'11", about 200 pounds, brown eyes, wavy dark hair, and presumably wearing a blue suit and gray top coat. 
There was already snow on the ground, and an additional five inches of fresh snow foiled attempts to track the escaped man or determine if an accomplice had been involved. The authorities had no idea where to start. It was possible he got a ride, but no one in the area admitted to giving a hitchhiker a lift on that night. The sheriff had not heard any vehicles driving or parking close to the jail. No one saw anything. The escape rekindled community fear of Irwin, now referred to as Mad Dog Killer. Gun, ammunition, and door lock sales again spiked. Over the course of the next three weeks, Irvin stole vehicles, walked, ran, and hitchhiked a meandering path westward. He had at least five close calls with law enforcement when his car slid off into a ditch and he had to be pulled out. He was recognized by someone, or the person he hitched a ride with was pulled over for one thing or another. A truck driver in Nebraska had been talking to Irvin, but, quote, suddenly needed to make a call to a friend, but I knew he was calling the police. Irvin stayed close enough to hear, and when the truck driver said, there's a dog here you might want to come collect, he knew the man had recognized him as Mad Dog Irvin. Irvin bum rides through Wyoming, Utah, and Nevada, where musician Victor Davis picked him up. Davis, a pianist for Tex Williams and his orchestra, gave Irvin a ride from Nevada to Los Angeles. In an interview following Irvin's arrest, Davis stated, quote, It just flips me. He was the nicest fellow. After a night of rest, Irvin burglarized a house in Los Angeles, taking jewelry, and then hitched a ride to Frisco, where he attempted to pawn a diamond ring and a pair of earrings. February 9, 1956, after being reported as acting suspiciously, Irvin was recognized in a pawn shop at 3rd and Market Streets in San Francisco. The store owner hadn't recognized who Irvin was, but said he, quote, just didn't fit with the diamond. When initially approached, Irvin claimed to be Victor Davis and produced identification with that name. He had stolen two of Davis's ID cards when Davis allowed him to spend the night in his apartment. You just can't be nice to people sometimes. No. Mm -mm. The inspectors John O'Keefe and Leo Firagario were doubtful of his claim and rang up Victor Davis, who cleared it up for them. Irvin admitted his identity and didn't resist arrest. When questioned, he commented, quote, I wasn't too surprised. I'd been expecting to get picked up for quite a while. Getting out of jail at Princeton wasn't too hard. I made some keys out of the cardboard covers of books and went through the doors. Wow. Who knew that would work? Hmm. Seriously. Cardboard keys in a jail cell. Mm -hmm. When asked where Sheriff was at the time, he replied that Sheriff Holland was, quote, up front watching television. You see, the sheriff and his family live in the front part of the jail. It was around 8 o'clock, I guess, and nobody else was around. Kind of like Andy Griffith, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Irvin was asked how he made the keys. He explained that he had asked for some glue to repair a religious metal he had had, and it was provided. He used it to glue together many layers of paper and cardboard from paperback books, along with some foil to make keys that were strong enough to turn. Irvin had a nearly photographic memory and was able to duplicate the shape of different keys for different doors by studying them while they were used by guards. He coated the keys with soap to test in the locks, beginning with his cell door, turning them lightly to get an impression of the internal tumblers, then refining the shape. When one key was done, he'd go through that door at night and work on the next one. The day after the escape, his cellmate, Bryant, admitted to helping Irvin hold up the steel plate of the cell door. He said he was afraid what would happen to him if he didn't cooperate. Traces of paper and soap were discovered inside the locks when removed. Smart guy, man. Slow and steady wins the race, I guess, right? The reason Irvin gave for his escape was he couldn't just sit in a cell waiting to hear about a new trial. He said it seemed he wasn't going to get one, so he left. While on the run, he mailed a letter to the attorney Lockyer saying he'd come back if he was granted a new trial. Yeah, that's how that works. Yeah, right. Sheriff Holland and Sergeant Cornett flew to San Francisco to escort their prisoner back to Indiana. Tickets were purchased for the group on Transworld Airlines. When the airline discovered who would be a passenger, they canceled the tickets and refused to take them. Irvin had to be returned to Indiana by train while chained to a detective. 
He was driven directly from Chicago to Indiana State Penitentiary in Michigan City, while his attorneys filed appeal after appeal in attempts to get a new trial. Irvin sat on death row for five years, during which four different execution dates were set. Eventually, his case found its way to the United States Supreme Court, where it was accepted for review. On June 5, 1961, the Supreme Court delivered a landmark decision that would affect the future of legal journalism from that day to the present. In Irvin v. Dowd, the Supreme Court ruled on several points. Justice Tom Clark delivered the finding of SCOTUS, which is the Supreme Court of the United States, requiring prospective jurors to have zero knowledge of a crime would create impossible criteria to fulfill all regions where the crime had occurred. However, proof for or against excessive bias and or jurors' inability to remain neutral and to base an opinion on evidence presented was up to the challenger, in this case, the state of Indiana. He indicated that this had not been done, and it was found that the Indiana Appeals Court should have investigated the source surrounding the jury selection before rejecting the second venue change, and that an additional move shouldn't have been denied due to clearly prejudicial opinions throughout the entire multi-county area. A direct quote from Judge Clark on the influence of public opinion, the publicity was, quote, so much so that curbstone opinions, not only as a petitioner's guilt, but even as to what punishment he should receive, were solicited and recorded on the public streets by a roving reporter and later were broadcast over the radio, end quote. The court further said that the newspapers had printed this information were delivered approximately 95% of the homes in Gibson County, and radio and TV stations reporting the same information blanketed both counties. Besides representing Irving as a, quote, confessed slayer of six, a killer without conscience or remorse, these outlets had printed and broadcast stories recounting details of Irving's background and discuss crimes committed as a juvenile. Because of this widespread pretrial publicity, the U.S. Supreme Court vacated Leslie Irvin's conviction and ordered a new trial oh to be held God. No. in a more neutral location. On October 18, 1961, the new trial was scheduled to be held in Sullivan County, two counties north of Gibson. During the second trial, Associate Defense Counsel George Taylor declared that the state's case didn't hold water. He claimed that the state had no evidence other than a coerced confession. Taylor asserted that the oral confession was obtained by offering Irvin a deal rather than being turned over to Kentucky for prosecution where the public vowed that Irvin would be hung, if not by the courts, by then the populace. Taylor also alleged that the Evansville Police Department had performed a confused investigation. Marion Rice, chief defense attorney, stated that Irvin was victimized by inefficient, sloppy police work. At the time, forensics as we know them didn't exist. Irvin always wore gloves and left few traces that were usable as evidence at the time. Kerr's wallet in his possession was the most concrete evidence they had and the loss of Wesley Kerr's coat was a mistake that didn't help public opinion of the investigation. On January 13, 1962, the jury deliberated over six hours. Again, Leslie Irvin was found guilty of the murder of Whitney Wesley Kerr, but this time his sentence was life in prison rather than death. The prisoner beamed a smile when the verdict was read. Leslie Irvin was returned to the Indiana State Pen to serve out his time. While incarcerated, Irvin became adept at leather work in the prison shop, and his work was sought after. Irvin was diagnosed with lung cancer in 1982, and the Mad Dog Killer died on November 9, 1983, at 59 years old. His body was returned to Evansville for burial. Now, here's a few explanations, just some to tie up some loose ends, you know, just a few explanations mm-hmm. that Irvin himself gave. Mm-hmm. So Mary Holland was the only victim who was beaten 
and Irvin beat her unconscious because after directing her to the restroom, she started to scream and fight back. So he silenced her by beating her with a blackjack, which is a leather-covered bludgeon with a short, flexible shaft or strap, and it's used as a hand weapon. She was most likely shot without regaining consciousness. Her autopsy showed numerous skull fractures. Wesley Kerr was cooperative with the gunman and pleaded not to be shot because he had a wife and three young children to take care of, but Irvin killed him anyway. Irvin remarked that he regretted he had to do it because he liked Wesley. He spent about three hours with Wesley at the station where they drank two Coca-Colas apiece and talked. He said when he saw the money at the register, he decided to rob him and that he had to kill him. The significance of the three dimes was not apparent since they were a link to the Holland and Sailor murders, where the coins were also left on the floor in the same manner. Irvin had been driving around the Kentucky countryside looking for a house to rob and had cased the Duncan homes when the fender bender occurred. He had attended to turn around when his car was hit by another driver, a 17-year-old Thomas Griffin. After his interaction with the driver's grandmother, he turned around and headed back toward the Duncan property. He broke a window and entered the home, ransacking it and taking about $5 he found from a piggy bank. Before he could leave, Goebel and Rabin surprised him. He pulled his gun out and had Raymond remove his father's belt and use it to bind his hands behind him. Having seen the car earlier, the elder man had written the license plate number on an envelope before he and his son had entered the house. At some point, Goebel dropped the envelope on the floor for police to find it. Unfortunately, Irvin saw this. He forced the two men to their car and Raymond to drive. Irvin kept his gun trained on Goebel. Twice they passed another car on Trig Turner Road. Raymond raised his hand, but no one took note of that anything was amiss. When the car reached a wooded, swampy area, Irvin ordered the Duncans out of the car and into the trees. Irvin stated, quote, I meant to tie them to a tree, but then I killed the first one, Goebel. I was tying the other one's hand behind his back, and I shot and killed him before finishing. Then I went back to the car and drove back to get that envelope. Both men were shot in the head and left lying in the sloppy mud where they fell. After killing the father and son, Irvin drove their car to the home after the Duncan property, that of Raymond and his wife Mary Alice, who was still in the hospital after the birth of their child the night before. In a tragic repeat of the scene just played out, Elizabeth and Mamie arrived home with Irvin in the house. He heard the car and met the ladies at the door. He claims he shot Mamie Duncan by mistake, and he stated while tying her hands, the gun discharged, striking her under the arm. She started to scream, and then I had to shoot her. He had taken Elizabeth into the adjoining bedroom. Quote, I told the girl to take off her bottom clothing. I tied up her hands and then decided to kill her too. I shot her in the head and let her fall onto the bed. His explanation for this had been reported both that he wanted her to be busy, quote, so she wouldn't run away while I shot the other one, and, quote, I wanted her to take off her clothes so she wouldn't follow me outside when I got ready to leave. Her blue jeans and loafers were found placed beside the bed where her body had fallen face down. Irvin thought the only family member who remained alive was Elizabeth's toddler, Shirley Fay. He did not harm her. He Thank left God. the farm... Mm -hmm. He left the farmhouse with the little girl sitting on the bed next to her dead mother. His reasoning for leaving two-year-old Shirley unarmed was, quote, I like kids. When he asked why he killed the Duncans, Irvin replied, quote, I don't know why I did it. I only got a dollar out of it. And the dollar had been Goebel's pocket. And that's the story of mad dog killer Leslie Irvin. He's a POS. He simply, he and his lawyer. Mr. Really? Lop, attorney Lop. How much Lop. money that guy made? To well, nineteen. I I don't know, but he's crazy. I mean, I cannot believe that any judge would have allowed all that crap to happen in his courtroom. Nope, I wouldn't think so either. But what do we know? We're mm. normal, rational beings. So there's True. that. Thank <laughs> you, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. Cynthia Great Riley, job. she wrote it out. Um, if she does or when she does go ahead publish this book, we will go ahead and tout it out and shout it from the mountaintops. It's true. I'm going to reach out and see what kind of T-shirt you want from us, size and color. Thank you very much. Very interesting case. Very interesting. Well, Jen, 
Remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye bye Love ya. Mary had been on the duty since 5 p.m. Mary had been on. Five had she been on duty since 5 a.m.? She had 5 p.m. Oh, 5 p.m. Mary had, yeah, about $1,400 to. Sorry, sorry, re... I was about to call Nico. Rico Suave. Rico Suave. Rico sorry, my suave. Rico. Sorry, Rico, I'm totally unprepared. You're funny. Ding ding, 600, ding 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 about ding, 60. ding okay ding 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 so ding. at at 29 years old Whitney Wesley Kerr what's wrong Wesley <laughs> remember that <laughs> what's no that's window what's wrong window what's wrong window Sorry. what's wrong inside joke oh uh, Wendell I wonder what he's doing now as a part of the 502nd Parachute Infantry he served as a paratrooper in the Battle of the Bulge I battle the bulge every day don't you Camille a- Amen. Let me cough. I need a drink of water. Clear my throat. Sorry. You got the coronavirus. I do. I do. Frank McDonald Sr., the current sheriff of Vanderbar... Vanderbra... Burrow? Vanderbra? Vanderburg? Yeah. Isn't that 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 new bra that pushes up? Oh, no. Sorry. I think so. Yeah. Uh, Frank McDonald Jr., Senior Frank McDonald, Sheen, Frank McDonald, <laughs> Senior <laughs> Lord have mercy. Pulled into the driveway of their family far ho- farm house. Fart. I was going to say fart house. It's not a <laughs> fart house. This house right now is a fart house because everybody's got diarrhea. <laughs> but that's something totally different. Uh. I all right. Hold on. I need okay. Oh. <sighs> okay. I'm trying not to oh, laugh. Yeah. I'm still laughing about the other Sorry, thing. I'm in a mood today. Trust me. I'm see, fine. It's say like something, say something. Junior edition. Junior. <laughs> I'm just in a mood. The weather's like so freaking nice and my my like meds have evened out. out. I know. I'm in such a great mood. However, he had sparted a car. He had sparted a car. <laughs> However, <laughs> I'm now starring in Fargo stage oh. play. The boys, are you okay? Yeah, I'm itching. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. Okay, I didn't think you could hear that. Sorry, my arm. Okay, go ahead. I'll turn on my phone. When five senses just turn enough. <laughs> the 2020 <laughs> Nissan Armada raises your awareness. Sorry, Nico. The following pronunciation is brought to you by pronouncenames.com. Bosse. Bosse. That's what I'll say. Yeah. Bosse. Yeah. Okay. What is now the FP Cully Power Generation Station? Sorry, that's not right. <laughs> what? That's another rhyme. <laughs> generation Station. <laughs> uh, what is Generation na- Station? No, no. The judge, of course, denied the P. Denied. The- <laughs> you got a P. By far the star wetness. Wetness. <laughs>